think we'll get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Hidden Life of the Forest Preserves webinar series. We're so glad you joined us this evening and hope you walk away with some new information about the insects that call Cook County home and that you're inspired to explore the hidden world of the Forest Preserves of Cook County and be mindful of all the little things around us. My name is Eric Zomber. I'm the North Branch Field Organizer here at Friends of the Forest Preserves, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Friends unites people to protect, promote, and care for the Forest Preserves in Cook County. And as an independent nonprofit organization solely focused on the Forest Preserves in Cook County, we work tirelessly to safeguard and improve the approximately 70,000 acres of Forest Preserves for all of us and generations to come. We're so glad to connect with you today. And we are currently hosting in-person small group programs in the field where we love to be the most but we're also happy to connect with all of you online tonight. A few housekeeping notes before I turn it over to Maya. Participants will be muted and have their video turned off for the duration of the webinar. To adjust your view of the speaker and moderator as you're watching the webinar, there'll be a button at the upper right-hand corner of the screen. And um, that should say view. Uh, you, that lets you toggle the options to whichever view you prefer if you only want to see uh, the presenter's video or just pre presentation itself, et cetera. Uh, additionally, feel free to type in a question at any point in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, and we'll try to answer those questions during the Q&A session after the presentation or in a follow-up email. If you'd like to make any comments via the chat, again, please make sure your two option is set to attendees and panelists so we can all read it. Um, you can also turn off closed captioning by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of the panel, control panel in your screen. If you have any questions about how to use Zoom or are having any technical issues during the webinar, please direct your questions to the panelists. And our tech support person, Gloria Orozco, is also the How You Met field organizer at Friends, will try to help you. And lastly, the session is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube for later viewing. Now uh, I'll be reading our land acknowledgement statement. Friends of the Forest Preserves acknowledges that Forest Preserves in Cook County are located on the ancestral homelands of the Council of Three Fires, a long-standing Anishinaabe alliance of the Ojibwa, Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi North American tribes. These lands have also been home and, and a place of trade for many other tribes, including the Fox, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Meskwaki, Miami, and Sauk people. For centuries, the, the native, these Native Americans cared for and protected these lands until ownership was largely stolen from them by US colonizers. Today we employ certain land management techniques that allow indigenous, uh, that follow indigenous practices. However, our forest preserves and our communities would greatly benefit from more intentional application of indigenous knowledge in how we manage and honor our protected areas. Chicago land is home to one of the largest and most diverse urban Native American communities in the United States. Community members celebrate, practice, and adapt their heritage and traditions with our modern urban environment. Uh, it is our responsibility to find common cause with community members and support their engagement with the forest preserve. We ask you to offer gratitude, respect, and support to the many Native American people, including their ancestor, ancestors, who consider the lands and water within Cook County sacred. And please join us in carrying on a legacy of respect and active caretaking of our earth for us and future generations. If you want to know more, uh, want to know what Friends is committed to or what or would like to learn more, please visit our website. I will now mute myself and hand it over to Maya Dutta, Pop Poplar Creek Field Organizer at Friends of the Forest Preserves. Enjoy. Great, thank you, Derek. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. To kick things off, I want to um, tell you all about the poll results. I had you come in and say how many species you think um, are native to Illinois in terms of insects. And the correct answer is that there are around 20,000 insect species and counting native to Illinois. I will say the first time I learned that, I was honestly amazed, mostly because once I came to understand that there are that magnitude of insect species within this state, I realized that there must be a multitude of natural histories, behaviors, relationships, and more that are just waiting to be learned about and discovered. 
So even that one tidbit of information helped me realize that there is a hidden life of insects and um, they deserve to be discovered and learned about and shared. And so I'm very excited you're all joining me here today with Friends of the Forest Preserves this evening to learn just about a subset of those insects, um, to think about what they do during the winter and what we can look for as early as tomorrow now that spring is here and it's really been warming up in Cook County. So to start off, I want to give you all some context for the landscapes and personal experience um, my information will be coming from. As I briefly touched on, or as Derek briefly touched on in the introduction, we work for Friends of the Forest Preserve, which is a nonprofit working closely with the Cook County Forest Preserves to help protect and preserve the natural spaces around us. Um, both for the recreation it can provide for our community, as well as for the habitat it can be for our many critical diverse native species. It's also very important to note that we as humans have never been and continue to not be separate from these natural spaces and our well being and livelihoods are inextricably linked to the proper care and access to these forest preserves. They belong to all of us and we can care for the land and the species within them and their hidden lives by learning more about them, volunteering and more. Above is, the photo, is a photo of one of the volunteer groups nearest, dearest to my heart, although I'm a little bit biased. Um, they're the Poplar Creek Prairie Stewards who have been working to restore hundreds of acres of native ecosystems in the Northwest Cook County region of the forest preserves for over the last 30 years. The preserves of the preserves the Poplar Creek Prairie Stewards have been working to restore are just a fraction of the land that we call our forest preserves in Cook County today. This system of natural areas makes up almost 70,000 acres, which equates to about 11% of Cook County or half the area of the city of Chicago. It's the oldest and largest county forest preserve district in the country. And given our unique ecological landscape and history, Cook County is the most ecologically diverse county in all of Illinois. We have oak, we have oak woodlands, wetlands, prairies, and more types of ecosystems. That means right here in our urban suburban backyards, we have access to and are a part of incredible nature. I have got to experience that nature firsthand in my role as Poplar Creek Field Organizer but a few life events have gotten me to this point where I'm positioned to talk to you all about native insects in our region. As I mentioned, I support the volunteer community known as the Poplar Creek Prairie Stewards, where I focused on volunteer engagement and recruitment for their ecological restoration efforts. A lot of this role in my eyes is focusing on fostering people's connections to nature in the many ways it may pique their interests, which of course lends itself to the way that I first discovered one of the most compelling aspects of nature to me, which is insects. I have always enjoyed being outside, especially working at a petting zoo and goat farm during high school, but an elective biology, took, a elective biology class I took during my senior year of high school really um, stuck with me. It was bug biology. So when I went on to college, I started studying environmental biology where I got to explore the field both literally and figuratively. And over the next few years, some highlights really stuck with me including spending a summer studying the effect of urbanization on native bees in, with the Chicago Botanic Garden. I also studied bee communities um, in, in recent prairie restorations in southwestern Minnesota one summer after graduation. So since those jobs, I've really been passionate about prairies, bees, insects, and urban ecology. I'm now really happy in my role here as Poplar Creek Prairie Steward, where I get to connect communities with nature but I usually am trying to find a way to talk about insects or observe bees along the way. So this webinar is a perfect, exa perfect example of me getting to share about my favorite organisms. And I'm very glad to have you all here with me to learn about them. So before we start, I just wanna begin and say that um, our forest preserves and everything within them are protected and we are not allowed to remove any, remove or damage um, any cultural or natural materials without prior permission. The preserves are home to many critical species and it is important that we respect that. Additionally, as I will be encouraging you all to go out and observe insects throughout the webinar, I want to remind you that we should never be catching, killing, collecting, or squashing or disturbing these insects as insect populations are declining at alarming rates. Finally, this webinar will show photos of insects, which you're all probably aware of, so I encourage you to lean into maybe some of the like creepy and weird feelings we can have about insects sometimes, especially since you're in the safety of your own homes tonight. So get really excited for it. I love looking at insects, so this is awesome for me. <laughs> 
So let's start off with the basics where we all begin when we're on our way to becoming insect enthusiasts. What even is an insect? Um, is it a bug? Is it a critter? Is it an arthropod? You may have heard of some of these terms, none of these terms. We use them interchangeably a lot of the times when we see like a small creature flying or something crawling around in our bathtub. Ugh. But they all actually mean different things. So let's test our knowledge and see if we, if we know what an insect is. So is this an insect? I, I hope I didn't scare you. I know for some people, spiders are reserved for Halloween decor. Um, but I put on the screen a photo of a dotted wolf spider, which is a spider native to the Cook County region. It lives in grassy fields, marshes, and leaf litter. Um, I would love you all to, to think about or put in the chat if you think that this spider is a type of insect. So it's, it's not. Um, this is not an insect. This spider belongs to the class arachnid, which is evolutionarily in a different class than insects, which is the class insecta. Um, they are related um, more broadly, however. So let's try it one more time. Do we think this dragonfly is an insect? Okay, so it is an insect, um, but how can we tell the difference between this being an insect versus that spider I just showed you? So since we're talking about insects, let's get, let's get a definition. Um, scientifically, some of the most defining characteristics about, an, about insects are that they have two antennae, um, three body regions, the head, thorax, and abdomen, three pairs of legs, so six total, um, and, two, and um, two pairs of wings, so four total. So no spiders aren't insects. Um, if you're familiar with them, they have eight legs, they don't have wings, they don't have antennae, um, and neither are centipedes that you find in your bathroom. They have like way too many legs. Um, but evolutionarily, like I said, spiders and centipedes are related to insects on a broader scale, but that is a topic for another webinar. Um, I'll also readily admit that even with this knowledge ingrained in my mind, I'll still generally call like a small critter with a bunch of legs an insect or a bug a lot of the times. But for the purpose of this webinar, I wanted to be specific so we all have a better idea of what we're talking about and seeing and coexisting with in our forest preserves and beyond. And even with those seemingly strict scientific parameters defining insects, we still have 20,000 species and counting in Illinois. And while they may be classified as having the same anatomical structures, I think it's truly beautiful how this can take form in so many different looks. So when I see a textbook picture like this, it reminds me that the rules we've outlined for biological classification purposes can really look like anything in real life. Um, it might be frustrating for some people, but this is one of my favorite things about biology. And of course, there are caveats to all things. So there's caveats to this definition, one of them being that the definition of an insect I just gave only really needs to be applied or true um, at the adult and reproductive stage of a species. So due to an insect's rigid body covering called an exoskeleton, they can't just expand and grow like we do. They have to go through different stages where they shed their outer layer a lot of the times. So all insects undergo metamorphosis. There are three different types of metamorphosis. One that we may be most familiar with is complete metamorphosis, which is shown here. It's when an insect will start out as an egg, transition into a larva, transition into a pupa, and then become an adult. So we might be familiar with this when we think about butterflies. We'll see their caterpillars um, like crawling around in the summertime. So we know that even though that caterpillar doesn't have wings, antennae, et cetera, um, once it becomes a butterfly, it does, and it's an insect. So now that we have a better understanding of what an insect is, um, I hope I'm on the way to getting all of you to love them as much as I do, but I also know it might not be that easy. For example, like what are insects doing all the time? I'm sure we can all attest we're constantly coexisting with them, both inside and outside, for better or for worse, depending on your position. Um, so let's learn a little bit more about how these sometimes hidden members of our communities um, interact with our surrounding environment and landscapes. What role or function do we often see them playing in the environment? 
So one of the most commonly known facts about insects is that they're important for pollination. Um, many insects will travel from flower to flower as a source of food, both in the form of nectar and pollen. So pollinators and flowering plants have evolved so tightly co-evolved that 80% of the world's flowering species are pollinated by animals, and most of these animals are insects. Um, this means insects are critical for helping maintain our healthy native ecosystems. And in terms of agriculture, 35% of the world's food crops depend on pollinators. I'm sure many of us are familiar with honeybees and their use in agricultural pollination. However, honeybees are not native to North America, do not account for the pollination of our native ecosystems, nor all of our crops, and have actually been reported to be detrimental to native bee populations. Our native bee species, on the other hand, pollinate important crops like apples and blueberries, and are actually being experimented with as pollinators for more sustainable forms of agriculture. Another kind of pollinator that we might not be as familiar with or know that it pollinates are beetles. So beetles actually have a very long history on this planet. They evolved about 200 million years ago, and they're in the picture evolutionarily before flowering plants evolved. Flowering plants evolved approximately 100 million years ago before pollinators like bees and butterflies had a, were around. So that means that um, beetles are thought to have been one of the organisms helping shape early plant, poll plant pollinator interactions. And due to this long history, many of the plants that are beetle pollinated today have similarly long lineages. Many beetle pollinated plants have specific characteristics due to beetle behavior. So they typically have cup-like flowers, strongly scented blossoms, as well as leathery and tough petals. Um, beetles will visit flowers for pollen as a food source, but they do not have specialized mechanisms for picking up pollen like some other insects do, like certain species of bees. So pollen grains will stick to their bodies and they'll move from flower to flower and they'll pollinate basically on accident. Um, they're sometimes referred to as mess and soil pollinators since they will eat through leaves and petals, leaving small holes, bits of plant matter wherever they go. That's why so many of the plants they pollinate have tough petals and leaves. They're often found on native and ornamental plants, including tulip and magnolia trees, as well as goldenrod and yarrow, just to name a couple. So in addition to the insects we see pollinating above ground, we also have a whole community underground that is even more hidden. Um, so, this is a photo of cicadas, which I'm sure we might be aware of. A lot of their larvae live underground for many years before they come out. And then this is a thrip. They all live underground as well. So insects that live underground are incredibly important to our ecosystems. They shred organic material, stimulate microbial activity, disperse nutrients around the soil, mineralize plant nutrients, aerate our soils, control pests, and a bunch of other things as well. And many insects underground, many of the insects performing beneficial functions in our soils underground are in great magnitudes. So it's actually been recorded that several thousand species of insects have been seen to live in a square mile of forest soil. And springtails are actually an example of an insect that lives in our soil. So they're the smallest insects that we have here at just a few millimeters, and there are 204 known species in Illinois. Um, they're an example of an insect that releases nutrients in our soils by feeding on fungi. They get the name springtail because, probably you can guess it, they're spring-like tail. Um, but if they're attacked by a predator, body fluid will rush to the tail base, making it slam forward, and it'll catapult them as much as a yard away. Um, and if we have gardeners in the audience, you may feel as though springtails are a pest because when populations get out of control, they can start feeding on roots and shoots that's generally due to an excess of moisture and decay. A study recently done by the Morton Arboretum actually better sought to understand microfauna diversity through insects um, in native and restored prairies. This study noted that native prairies have the most species of springtails compared to restored prairies, but it also suggested that two species of springtails could be indicator species for good restorations. So this indicates that while we often monitor plants to let us know how resilient or how ecologically healthy a restored prairie is, we may be able to start looking to things like the insects in our soils to do the same thing. 
It is important to note that also, very generally, especially given their vast numbers, insects are critical members of our ecological and agricultural communities. Pollination and soil benefits like I just talked about are only a portion of the many known ecological services provided by insects. They additionally interact with one another in different ways by controlling populations of other organisms, providing a source of food for some organisms and more. And with so many insects, they likely affect our ecosystem in beneficial ways we're only just starting to uncover with more research and a better understanding of our natural systems. And while I don't have the time to get into it today, the photo on this slide is of an ant with aphids, which they're actually known to farm in a way. It's a very interesting um, symbiotic relationship and I encourage you all to look it up after this webinar. So those few examples I just gave um, are examples of concrete ways insects ben directly benefit us. My favorite thing about insects and arguably one of the most beneficial things about them though is that they're so biodiverse. As I've been referencing throughout the webinar so far, there are over 20,000 known species of insects native to Illinois. The numbers are even bigger than that though. There are around 90,000 known species in the United States and 900,000 known species in the world. But scientists estimate that there are likely a total of five to 15 million species of insects total. Insects are the most diverse group of organisms accounting for 80% of the world's species. And biodiversity is constantly cited as one of the most important factors of ecological resi resilience and ecosystem function. So to me, vast biodiversity of insects just makes them inherently beautiful, amazing, and critical to continue to understand, care for, and protect. There's actually been a recent controversy about the most diverse group of organisms within insects. So for a very long time, beetles were known as the most diverse group of insects. So beetles were known to have the most species. But in past years, parasitic wasps, wasps that lay their eggs in other organisms, have been hypothesized as potentially being the most diverse group of insects. This is extremely exciting to me because biodiversity is my favorite thing about biology and parasitic wasps are one of my favorite groups of insects due to their incredible behaviors with other organisms. I've actually really come to appreciate wasps, wasps the summer that I spent studying bees in Chicago, because as we were observing bees, there were so many wasps in the area, it was in, practically impossible not to watch them too. And this is what made me so excited about them. I saw metallic blue wasps, I saw huge wasps, I saw really tiny wasps, I saw wasps feeding on nectar on the same plant as a bee and an ant. I saw wasps running around the ground, running on the ground, hunting for crickets. Each of these wasps had a hidden life that I was at that point completely unaware of. And these wasps were quite frankly, very busy tending to their needs. So many of the wasps in Chicago are native, solitary, docile, and un uninterested at hum in humans. Plus they're incredibly important for our ecosystems. They're pollinators, decomposers, and members of our ecological communities often controlling populations of other insects. So one of the wasps that really caught my attention that summer, um, I was studying bees, is the cicada killer wasp. It was mostly because it was so big, it was impossible not to see. It was also always feeding on Queen Anne's lace. And so just like, that's like a flat white flower. And it was just such a, it was so beautiful. I loved it. Um, so I learned it was the cicada killer wasp and thus kind of sparked my obsession with those types of wasps and also parasitic wasps in general. Um, so at up to 1.5 inches long, this is the largest wasp in the Midwest. They're a solitary species that nests in the ground. These wasps will typically emerge um, between June and July to mate, so we have some time to look out for them. Um, after mating, females will then select a site to dig their burrow, which typically goes about 10 inches deep, um, and they'll place their eggs in that burrow. So the female wasp will then look for a cicada, they'll capture it mid-flight, and then once caught, the wasp will sting the cicada and paralyze it. The wasp will then carry the cicada to its burrow, but because the cicada is often larger and weighs more than the wasp, the wasp will sometimes use physics to lug it up a tree and then basically take flight off of the tree and so it can land with a particular angle into its, into its burrow. The female will then lay an egg inside a cicada, get a couple more cicadas to accompany, accompany that cicada in the burrow, um, and then the egg will hatch in about two or three days. 
The larva will then feed for about two weeks. It'll spin a cocoon inside that um, burrow and it'll remain there throughout the winter with emer while emerging as an adult the following summer. Uh, this wasp is incredibly important for the maintenance of our cicada populations. And as some of you may be aware, there is a brood of 17 year cicadas that is emerging this year um, in some locations in the United States, in some places in Illinois. So maybe you'll see some cicada killer wasps too. Um, so all of the insects I've given examples of are native to Cook County, uh, which I hope has grounded these vast numbers and behaviors for you all a little bit. Talking generally and about such magnitudes can often be incomprehensible, at least to me. So I'd like to transition us to think a little bit more about Cook County so we can, some of us can relate a little bit better. So prior to urban and suburban development, this region consisted of a number of native ecosystems, including prairies, savannas, woodlands, and more. Our biodiverse native insects have co-evolved and existed within these landscapes, producing tight relationships and needs between the two. And while it's not a question that we'll see insects in the urban areas of Cook County, the biodiversity of insects has steadily, steadily been declining over the past decades due to land use change, including due to suburban and urban development, as well as agriculture. So furthermore, issues like artificial light has been cited as a factor leading to decline in insect populations. So the forest preserves here provide a particularly unique and critical safe haven for our native insects, being such a great expanse and native expanse. I want you all to be able to enjoy that, whether you're an insect expert or not. So I'd now like us to take some time to think about what insect observation could look like. For many people, observing nature is, can be about species ID. And while I think species ID is a very interesting facet of nature observation, I don't want it to be a barrier. Insect species identification can be very difficult, but that doesn't mean we can't observe or ID insects to broader identification than species. So this is the taxonomic rank for biological classification. And while we usually try to be as specific as possible going down to species, it's often more feasible to ID insects to family or genus and I have resources at the end of this webinar for those who are interested in doing this. But for me, um, knowing that the combination of an insect's natural history, behavior, and more are all represented to some extent and an individual of a species, that's enough reason for me to get outside and want to take a look at something, whether I know what species it, species it is or not. Um, observation gives us the opportunity to really appreciate insects and the excitement they bring into our world. And it doesn't take much, just a little bit of curiosity. So let's pretend we're all in the field together, or at least you're in the field with me, and I'll provide some commentary on insects as if we're seeing them in real time. So bear with me. It can, it can be really fun. Uh, so, okay, I love this. I mean, it looks like some kind of bee to me. Um, it's jet black, which I love. It has super long antennae. It kind of makes me think it could be a male because I know male bees generally have, generally have longer antennae. I love the way it's clasping onto this twig. If we were actually out in the field together, like we would be at this spot for a while watching this bee. So we might know this is a monarch caterpillar. We might not. I don't think it matters. I'm looking at its bright contrasting colors. It's also like thick and round and juicy, which I love. I'm, I'm looking at it on that small twig that it's on and I'm thinking about how its legs are probably clasping onto that tiny branch so it doesn't fall off. I also see it's probably not feeding on that small branch. So I wonder if it's going from one feeding spot to another, you know, where, where, it's off, where is it off to? Okay, so I love this photo too. Um, there are so many tiny beetles on just that bunch of flowers. I wonder if they're together um, or if they're like totally separate and basically maybe beetles just really like that flower. Um, it also kind of reminds me of an apartment complex, how they're like beetles on the top floor, on the second floor. Uh, bottom floor, so fun. Um, okay, so this one, I think I'd probably find this on accident because it bends, blends in so well with its surroundings. I love how crisp and green it looks. This also reminds me of one of those insects that kind of just like accidentally ends up on your shoulder while you're on a hike somewhere um, and they're really calm and they just jump off randomly too. So absolutely beautiful butterfly. I love those dots on it on its wings, kind of giving like a little bit of eye action. 
And then I'm loving those tiny beetles on the bottom of that flower too, if that's what they are. Um, I just love the idea that there are multiple insects on a flower again. And then this dragonfly quite literally takes my breath away. I'm thinking about how teeny tiny and light it must be that it's resting on what looks like the world's like thinnest piece of grass or sedge. Like how is it balancing on that? I, I can't even imagine if there's any wind, would it be knocked off? Amazing. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and let's zoom out for a minute. At this point in the webinar, I hope I've turned you all into insect lovers like I am. Going to locations like the forest preserves give me a great opportunity to see so many different insects, some that I'm familiar with, some that I've never seen before. And when approaching a scene like this, some might think that, you know, they're looking at flowers or the landscape, but I just really can't wait to get in there and crouch down and watch a single stalk and watch the insects on that flower. Um, sometimes I'll be watching a bee with a single, or I'll be watching a single flower and there'll be multiple bees on it or other insects. They'll kind of be like fighting with each other. One bee will grab onto another one and rip it off the flower. It always makes me laugh. I, I didn't realize that there'd be such interspecific drama happening at such a small scale, but you know, it's true. I got this video, um, it's in slow motion. Look at that. Did we see that? Let's, let's watch it again. Oh my gosh. It's just like, get, get off of that flower right now. Um, so obviously observing insects in the forest preserves is a huge part of how I engage with and enjoy nature. So that makes winter with the cold and the snow and absence of insects really difficult for me. Um, but I don't want that to be something that is a barrier for me or for you to getting outside or even engaging with insects. Sure, we might not be able to see a bee collecting pollen on a flower, but there are aspects of insects that we can learn about or observe come winter that might help us enjoy the season and feel connected to the landscapes all year round. So that brings me to the question, what happened to our insects this past winter? It can be complicated, but there are generally three different ways that insects will take on winter. So many insects will spend their spring and summer seasons gaining strength by eating, um, finding another or quite a few insects of their species to mate with, building their nest, laying their eggs, and then dying. Um, their genes will live on in their eggs that will overwinter and develop into larvae and their nest until it gets warm and then they'll emerge and do it all over again. So the photos on this slide show a stem nesting bee, um, how they lay their eggs inside a stem and they'll have their larvae develop over winter. So they'll often, as you can see here, um, they'll often lay multiple eggs kind of like on top of each other, if you will, within one stem. As another example, I'd like to introduce you all to cellophane bees, a family of solitary bees that come out in early spring. They're actually already here. They're the first bees we generally see out in this region. Um, both stem nesting bees and cellophane bees are solitary. 90% of bees are actually solitary. And like cellophane bees, 70% of them nest underground. So in mid to late March, these bees will emerge from their nests, which are conical piles of dirt with a large hole in the middle that serves as the entrance to their burrow. Um, inside the burrow is basically a small cell where the egg will develop. And they're known as cellophane bees because the female secretes a substance that lines the nest that when dry feels like cellophane basically. Um, so eggs are suspended in the cell on top of a collection of pollen and nectar that the larvae will feed upon once hatched. And then before once fully developed, they'll come out and emerge. So in these last few weeks, when it was like a little chilly outside, we had a whole bunch of native cellophane bee larvae munching on pollen and nectar right below our feet. Um, and now they're here enjoying the spring weather. So another way that insects will survive throughout the winter will be by undergoing through undergoing diapause, which is a physiological state that an animal will go through, making them dormant and basically have a delay in development during non-optimal environmental conditions. So this can occur at any life stage. Um, so many eggs will go through a state of diapause prior to beginning development. Um, but some insects are unique in that they will go through diapause as adults. 
So one example of an insect that goes through diapause in their adult state are queen bumblebees. So let's take a closer look. So unlike most native bees, which are solitary, bumblebees live in colonies between 50 and 100 individuals, but only mated queens overwinter as adults. So in late March and April, queen bees will emerge from their overwintering spots in the ground. And once emerged, these queens will forage for nectar and pollen to gain strength. They'll also start looking for a place to build their nests for their colonies, um, often under bunches of prairie grass or cavities in the ground. So the queen will then build the nest out of waxy material from pollen and nectar, and then lay eggs. And then the queen will incubate incubate them by sitting and shivering on top of them for several days. Prior to this, the queen will have also collected nectar and placed it in a small pot made out of the same waxy material in front of her. And the queen will sip that while she's incubating her eggs um, to basically have energy. So once those eggs hatch and the larvae emerge, the queen will then leave the nest and bring nectar and pollen to them as they become adults. Once they become adults, they're worker bees the queen will rarely leave the nest and she'll start laying more eggs. And eventually by the end of the summer, um, new queens are laid and they will do the cycle all over again. They'll go out, mate, and then overwinter. So um, another way insects deal with winter is through migration. Many of, the, many of us may know about the classic monarch butterfly, which migrates to Mexico during the winter, but other species of insects migrate as well including some dragonflies. So here's the common green darner dragonfly, which migrates um, nearly 900 miles to some extent. And so they'll come in the spring, leave in the fall. And this is really peaceful to me, seeing that and that, those noises. I miss, I'm really excited for a scene like this again. <sighs> okay. So I hope this information so far has been helpful in allowing you to understand insects' hidden lives a little bit more, as well as how to enjoy them even when it's not warm outside. Um, the forest preserves, as I've been saying, are critical for maintaining our region's biodiverse native insect communities. And if you'd like to help them, there are a few different ways you can do so. So first, um, our insects need high quality habitat with adequate food, shelter, nesting material, and more. So by volunteering at the forest preserves, you'll be helping restore the land in ways which will benefit insects. Volunteering is year round. And I encourage you that if you're unsure about volunteering to try out at least one workday per season. I thought I was someone that only liked working outside in like the pure heat, but I joined workdays this winter and I actually really enjoyed it. I didn't like I bundled up and I didn't realize how much I would love building brush piles and logging um, wood and like throwing it into the brush pile, which is a lot of our activities in the winter. So just give it a try. There's something for everyone out there. Um, and there are also monitoring opportunities specifically for butterflies and odonates. And this is through a training provided, provided by the forest preserves. They're actually occurring now for the next month or so. So please um, go to the forest preserve website to learn more. And I'll send that out in an email after this webinar as well. So I would also encourage you all to go out and observe, of course. Um, I came to better understand insects and the organisms and feel the need to learn and explore and teach people about them just by observing them. So if you haven't gone outside on a sunny summer day and sat and watched insects on a flower, then I highly encourage you to do so. You can start just in your backyard, but our forest preserves also are a great place to see a diversity of insects on a diversity of flowers. If observation is something you're really finding yourself intrigued in, then I would encourage you to get some low cost tools that will help you get to know the species and insects a little bit better without harming them. And so there are a couple of books and tools that are really helpful with insect ID and I've listed them on the screen. Like I said before, a species ID for insects can be incredibly difficult depending on the species and organism, but there's always room for broader ID and sharpening your skills to knowing what parts of insects are even important for ID. So I re recommend Kaufman's Field Guide to the Insects of North America, The Bees in Your Backyard, iNaturalist, which is an app where you can post photos of species that you see and have other community scientists in the area um, ID them. And then I also would encourage you that if there are children in your life um, to get them outside and unafraid of bugs, 
bugs are exciting and cool. And it's actually one way that kids can really get outside and explore nature. Insects are animals. And in a lot of ways, they're our most accessible forms of wildlife. I would also encourage you all to do your part to whatever extent you're able to. So if you have access to your own backyard or garden, um, a community garden space, please plant native flowers and prairie grasses. Um, they're connecting habitats for insects and especially since habitat fragmentation due to development is constantly threatening the health of our native insect communities. I would also encourage you all to leave your garden a little bit messy. So you don't need to pick up all your leaf litter or you don't need to cut down all your prairie grasses because there are insects nesting there and they will be overwintering and developing throughout different points in the season. So if you're able to do so, I would really encourage it. There are signs out there that you can buy um, that kind of explain your garden if you want to, you know, let people that are walking by know, you know, why your garden might look like that. And then finally, I would just ask you all to advocate for native plantings. Um, if you're a part of a school, a church, or a workplace that has landscaping, uh, you can suggest having native landscaping. Native plantings are often inexpensive and quite easy to take care of. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this webinar and I hope you all learned something new about insects. I'm very happy to answer questions and for anything that we don't get to, I will uh, send it in a follow-up email, but this has been a really great time for me. So I hope you all had fun as well. Thank you so much, Maya. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we hope that you're able, that we're, we hope that we're able to see you out in the field sometime, but in the meantime, keep in touch via email, social media, and our website uh, to look for more webinars. Uh, right now, we'll, we'll open it up to questions. Um, and let's see, what, what do we have in the Q&A so far? Um, let's see. Jeffrey asks, do all insects have wings, such as ants? That's a very good question. So broadly, most insects do have wings. There are some exceptions. To ants, I will say, uh, most of the ants we see around um, that don't have wings are not reproductive. So as I said earlier, that um, usually the definition of an insect will apply at the reproductive and adult stage of an insect. Ants are like social insects. And so a lot of the members of their community are basically like worker ants and they won't be reproducing. So they don't have wings, but for our classification purposes, that's okay. Okay. And are there uh, positive uh, ecological ways to keep springtail populations in check in your garden during the wetter seasons? That is a very good question. I would have to look into that a little bit more for you. I have to say, I haven't, I haven't really had the opportunity to garden much in my life yet. I haven't had a, my own garden. So I haven't really dealt with um, springtail population. So I'll have, to, I'll have to get back to you on that one, but I can send you an email. Peter wants to know, do you have a favorite native bee? I was hoping someone would ask me that question. And so I actually did some research before this so I could narrow it down. And I, so I didn't, but I kind of did. Um, I have this really big bee poster in my room that has a bunch of bees on it. So I went there to take a look and think about, think about my potentials. So I came, I came up with um, sweat bees, which is a group of bees. Um, they're really tiny and I love them one because they're so tiny and two, they're often this like metallic blue or green color. Um, you can look them up. There's um, the helictids. If you look up helictid or helictidae, um, you should be able to find some cool photos of metallic green bees. Um, there are also some like smaller black ones that are in that family that are also really cool. Okay, we have a few questions about cicadas. And first, will, will we see lots of cicadas in Chicago this year? And also, um, let's see, when large 
broods of cicadas emerge, does it affect the populations of cicada killer wasps? Cool. So I actually don't think Cook County is in the region of Illinois that is being affected by the 17 year brood of cicadas that are emerging this year. I think Cook County is in the region that will be affected by the brood of 17 year cicadas that's coming out in 2024. So you have three years to prepare um, if you're living in Cook County. If you're living elsewhere, um, I can't say. There are, it's in a few different places in the United States. So I encourage you all to look up brood X cicadas and it should probably tell you if, if they're coming to your, if they're coming to your location. Um, and the second part of that question was Will it affect the cicada killer populations? Um, this is just me hypothesizing. So I would hypothesize, yes, it probably will increase them. Um, but then I would hypothesize that if there are potentially less cicadas the next year, it would kind of even out um, that increase in population. So I don't think it's probably something that is really, obviously I think all these ecological communities are keeping each other in check more or less. Um, so maybe the next year we will have more cicada killers, but um, nothing long term, I would say. Okay, let's see. Next question. Uh, in the image of the stem nesting bees, are the chambers in the stalk naturally occurring in the plant, or are the cells created by the insect? This question is from Barbara. Yeah, so the, the sections are created by the insect. Um, they'll create Basically, um, all native bees are kind of able to secrete these different substances just from pollen and nectar. Um, so like when I talked about the cellophane bees, that cellophane-like material is from pollen and nectar. When I talked about the bumblebees, that wax-like material is from pollen and nectar. So um, same with those stem nesting bees, they'll have um, basically a material they can create out of pollen and nectar and kind of patch, patch everything up in there and keep them keep them separated. But I have like thought about that a lot in terms of, you know, what if one bee is ready to come out before the other and it's like at the end and it can't, I haven't answered that question. I haven't really looked into it, but something I think about often. So our next question is from Claudia and she would like to know where do uh, the, the common green darners migrate to? Yeah. Um, just basically any southern state in the winter months. So they occur in basically every state in the United States, I would say. Um, so they'll spend their winter months in the southern states and then they'll come back and well, they'll lay their eggs and then they'll, those eggs will hatch basically in the spring in those summer states and they'll come to the north, they'll mate, lay their eggs and then they'll hatch and come down to the southern states, if that makes sense. Awesome, and we have another cicada question. And this question is, why do cicadas only come out after 17 years and how did this behavior evolve? That is a good question. So we have, there are quite a few different types of cicadas. So there are cicadas that come out every 17 years and we'll have different broods of them across the country. Um, then there are also cicadas that come out like in different intervals. I actually can't say why that occurs. I know they have very active lives underground too. Um, so it just honestly has to do with like their reproductive stages, I would have to say. Um, but I don't know how they evolve that way. It seems kind of like it's really a lot of chance involved for that to happen, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> Great, and we have a question from James. Uh, do urban residents in the city of, of Chicago or cities like Chicago's, uh, do, can, can they have uh, beehives in their backyard and perhaps even honeybees for small scale honey production? So I would check um, with your local like sitting, city zoning codes. Um, I would encourage you to, if you, I would encourage you not to keep honeybees in your backyard because they aren't native and they do um, affect our native bee population. So they have been seen to um, 
be detrimental to them. So I would encourage you not to keep honeybees um, in your backyards, but if it is something you really feel strongly about, then um, I would have to say you, you have to look into that a little bit more. Okay, another question. This one is uh, about mosquitoes. Uh, Kathy asks, do mosquito abatement districts spray in the forest preserves or, and let's expand this question to around the forest preserves and how does that affect other species? That is a good question. I'm actually gonna throw it to you, Derek. Do you know if they spray in the forest preserves? In the forest preserves themselves, I don't think they do, but uh, there are communities around the preserves that spray around near the preserves and uh, sometimes these sprays do drift into the forest preserves themselves, unfortunately. And if you're right next to the preserves, you know, there can be runoff issues. So they, they, they're they not good for the environment at, at all, that's for sure. And I'm not sure if anybody's really looked into just how much of an effect this has on, you know, adjacent natural areas, but um, I can tell you it's not good. Thanks. <laughs> And let's look for another question. Um, okay, Karen says she had uh, Katie dids on her hibiscus last year uh, that mimicked the darker colors of the plant and flowers. And are there very many different species of Katie? Are there many species of Katie dids? So I'm not. I'm definitely not a Katie did expert. What I will say is that every time I hear about an insect, I am quite literally always surprised at how many species of, in, like there are of that insect. So I cannot tell you how many species of katydids there are out there, but I will say there probably are a lot, <laughs> but that's just my guess. Okay, we have a question about bee houses. Do you have an opinion on them? Oh, I love that. Um, I do have an opinion. I think, I think you, I think they definitely don't hurt. And so they're a great thing to have out. I think some arguments against them are that other insects will nest within them. And I think to that, I say the more insects, the merrier. So whether you have bees nesting in them, where you, whether you have another insect nesting in it, I don't think it's an issue as long as you're not having um, invasive insects nesting in them. And generally that has not seemed to be the case. Um, something I have seen mentioned is that um, if possible, if you could not reuse your um, like bee home or bee nest every year. And so they are relatively cheap and also they're pretty easy to make at home. Like if you have kids and you wanna make them, that's a really fun activity. And so I would just say, definitely have them out there if you can, um, but just change them out every year. Good advice. Okay, this might be our the last question we have time for. This one is from June, and she uh, would like to know, uh, are yellow jackets native? And um, you said that you had observed uh, that they were, that they're docile wasps, uh, but yellow jackets can be quite aggressive. So any, any, I don't know, any tips on how to deal with that and more insight into wasp behavior? Sure. So I, I'm not positive, but I do not think yellow jackets are native. I will have to look into that for you. I will say that generally um, social insects, so yellow jackets are social. Social insects are generally, um, don't want to say aggressive, but they are more willing to sting because a lot of times, so for solitary insects, you are basically, like if you were a solitary insect, you in evolution's terms, like you are like there and you want your genes to be passed on and like you have your egg and that's what matters. But for um, social insects, there's often reproductive insects and there are non-reproductive insects. And so it's much easier evolutionarily for those non-reproductive insects to sting because they are not producing eggs and that's kind of what they're there for in a lot of ways, um, like protection. So. That's what I would say to that. If you do see like social wasps, there is more, um, there's probably gonna be more of a chance that they will be quote unquote aggressive. Awesome. Well, I think we're gonna end it there.
uh, thank you everyone again. And uh, I found this very informative and I hope you did as well. Uh, we did not get to all of your questions. Uh, so we will follow up with all of you uh, via email. Uh, please do reach out if you think of any more questions about insects or, or the forest preserves, or if you have any ideas about those things. Friends is a membership-based organization, and if you feel inspired to join us as a member or make any donations to support our work, Gloria, our Calumet field organizer, who's been behind the scenes running our Zoom tonight, will put the link to our donation page into the chat. Thanks for joining us, and take care. Thank you. Yeah.